So anyhow, thank you all for, for coming. It is a pleasure to finally be here. I, I know some of you already. I work with some of you. Uh, but many of you I know just from uh, many emails we exchanged in the past few months. And so it is uh, really nice to finally meet you. And I hope uh, we will have a, a productive meeting. So this meeting was really conceived as a, more as a workshop. than a, It's not a conference. It's not a formal conference. I hope it will be an informal workshop uh, then, and, and that we'll have uh, plenty of discussion to explore uh, areas in which the efforts that, uh, whether it is in research, in academia, in public health, vector control, uh, other areas, how these uh, uh, efforts uh, interface and what could be potential directions uh, for the future where there are synergies that we could uh, explore further. So what I'd like to do in these talks uh, in, in this afternoon is to to start with a few, a few talks that will set hopefully the stage for, for the topic um, and to bring what I consider a dynamical perspective to these problems, uh, to look at the spatial temporal patterns in particular, and, and here, uh, of course, the, the sort of uh, tradition of long surveillance programs in India to sustain control are particularly interesting. So uh, after that, we will have today a talk on some climate to set the stage for climate. And then we wanted to take uh, advantage of the previous meetings. So we have some of the, the people that organized that here. So we will hear uh, on this uh, open platform to, for sensing cities. We will hear about the, the Tata initiative. And we have some time for discussion today to see how uh, our efforts on infectious diseases may interface with those, uh, with, uh, with those plans. So that's for today and tomorrow uh, we will get more into, into the, the, the real uh, core of the meeting, hopefully starting with uh, some of the description of some of the surveillance programs, the data sets that are so instrumental to uh, understanding these problems if we want to think about the present and the future on the basis of the past. And so uh, that's what we'll do in the morning, then we'll have a little bit of work at the interface with climate. That's an area uh, that um, is not as well developed, but that we'll hope uh, we'll, we'll discuss. And then we'll end with some talks on methodological uh, work that could inform these kinds of efforts, whether it is uh, with uh, modeling in hydrology, uh, experiments in entomology, or looking at the vulnerability of populations from a socioeconomic perspective. I have left some time in the afternoon, hopefully for discussions, whether we do it as a group or we break into groups, uh, we'll, we'll see as we go along. So anyhow, this audience does not need these statistics or there are many more numbers of this kind that talk about uh, urbanization in general in the world and the, the, the consequences. Now, this uh, increase in urbanization is occurring concurrently with changes in climate and for many of the diseases we are interested in, uh, waterborne, vector-borne infections, this of course creates new challenges. And I think it is fair to say that urbanization and climate change are the two major environmental challenges of the 21st century. Now, when we think of, of, of course, climate change, I'm not just thinking about long-term trends. I'm par in particular more interested in climate variability, the kind, the kind of interannual variation in the monsoons, in the El Nino, in extremes, etc. And their effects on transmission dynamics of these climate-sensitive diseases. That, and of course, this is primarily a temporal axis. And what is really interesting but more difficult is how do we interface that with the spatial uh, variation at finer scales that occurs whether because of uh, access to water, population density, socioeconomic disparity, environmental heterogeneity, etc. So the problem is how do we put those elements together? And you can say, well, on the spatial front, uh, there is a long history of looking at patterns and epidemiology since the early work that we all know uh, by snow discovering the waterborne nature of cholera. I, th I think uh, this kind of work in the present, uh, of course, it's uh, 
supported by great developments in GIS, remote sensing, anything uh, at, at very fine scale, but it's generally focused on epidemiological events and shorter times than the characteristic temporal scales that we address problems uh, that, uh, that we address problems on climate. And then when we look at uh, temporal, uh, the temporal variation and climate effects, it tends to be the other way around. It's much more aggregated in space. So this is an example of our own work on, on cholera, for example, in an area south of Dhaka known as MATLAB. Uh, the details do not matter. This is a time series of cases aggregated at, uh, at, uh, over villages where you see the temporal variation in the size of outbreaks. Uh, the different seasons, uh, which has led to many questions on the role of climate. But again, this uh, misses the, the spatial dimension. And these kinds of environments in rural environments for cholera in this case are very different from the environments of a city such as Dhaka. We're ignoring the spatial variation, whether it's in socioeconomic or in uh, environmental factors is uh, extremely difficult. So. We come from this more temporal perspective where we have these long-term records. We like to work with the, the records on the cases, the surveillance records, and use models to ask questions about the role of climate. Uh, and in particular, to integrate uh, to, or separate the role of uh, the environment from the epidemiological dynamics. With the understanding that this may be useful if we like to understand control in the context of climate. So um, this is an example uh, from our work in India and a collaboration with uh, Menobuma, Ramesh Diman and others in the past few years. Again, aggregated at the regional level, at the level of districts. This is, these are just time series for malaria in red uh, in the district of Kutch from the surveillance um, here at the national level, and, and you have also the, the rainfall. Uh, you don't need to do much analysis to, to know that in these arid regions, the two are correlated. But of course, uh, you can look at early warnings, you can look at modeling these problems, but we all know that with intervention, these patterns change. So we uh, are not uh, considering this uh, role of climate in a vacuum, I think that to uh, to ask questions about the intervention and the interplay with intervention, it is important to take into consideration the climate variability. An example is here, uh, again, just for the purpose of introduction, and, and again, aggregated in a temporal sense. This, this is uh, for the other um, parasite uh, of malaria, Plasmodium vivax, but you can do the same for Plasmodium falciparum. And the data are again in red, and the point I want to make uh, with this uh, exercise is simply that you can fit a model of transmission to the first part of the data and then say, what would you have predicted for the, the more recent times? If you are in public health and you want to know whether the, the recent outbreaks, the lower recent outbreaks, are the result of intervention, you cannot ask that question without considering what was happening to rainfall. This model purely based on rainfall would have predicted in blue the, the close trajectory of the system. So in this particular case, you can say intervention is not responsible for the low seasons. Uh, rainfall itself uh, is, is the dominant force. For falciparum, the opposite is true, and, and we know that the drugs, uh, the recent uh, interventions and policies in falciparum are having an effect in this part of the world. So now moving on to cities, uh, that's kind of the background that brought us here, and uh, we uh, were lucky to meet then uh, people in this uh, area in Northwest India working in cities. And so uh, we got involved with uh, this project on urban malaria, first in Ahmedabad and more recently in Surat. But what I like to do to, to illustrate where we were coming from is to talk a little bit about cholera in, the, in Dhaka, Bangladesh, uh, move to another disease, rotavirus, this diarrhea disease of children, that, uh, and the main, the main diarrhea disease of children, which you will not consider climate sensitive, but I like to show you uh, a different view on that, and then end with the, the recent work. 
again, these are just examples, and um, of course they don't go to the spatial resolutions that we will see in the next talk, uh, the finer, uh, the more uh, fine, fine spatial scales uh, that we will see there. So, but starting with, with cholera, there is plenty of evidence that cholera in the region of the Bay of Bengal in general responds to uh, climate variability. This is a map um, that I like a lot because it speaks for itself. Uh, it's not a map of El Nino, it's a map that takes the cholera cases post-monsoon in the second season of cholera in Madlab, Bangladesh, and just correlates them with every grid point of the world ocean. Uh, the, the positive correlations are in, in the reds, uh, the significant ones are in black. This is just exploratory, and you can see that warming in the Pacific nine, nine months earlier is followed by higher epidemics in the fall. Okay, this is correlative. Uh, this long distance connection um, seems to be, con uh, seems to, to operate through precipitation and flooding. That's work of our climate colleagues. And the last piece of work we did after many years of studying cholera was to say, well, we have a very large El Nino in 2016. Can we challenge our models to produce a forecast, a sort of real time forecast? Uh, as an early warning. Of course, we are still waiting to see were we, were we correct or wrong. It doesn't matter. Either way, I think we will learn something. In this exercise, you have the cholera cases in the city of Dhaka, and I will show you later how we decided at what level to do this. Uh, in, the, in the black is the data, uh, the, the training period for the transmission model that has the El Nino Southern Oscillation as a covariate is, is in the first part of the time series. The colorful uh, period that follows is just saying, well, how well would we have predicted the few years after that that were low seasons in the blues and the purples? You can see that we were doing pretty well at saying those low seasons, essentially you could explain with the conditions of the Pacific. The red is our forecast for this coming season. Again, we haven't yet observed it enough to know whether we are wrong or right. But let me tell you where we, how we got into uh, that model. So we were working with the city, and the city data was provided to us at the level of TANAS, the districts of the city, which to us was interesting because until then we had always seen it in aggregated form. So these were data from 1995 to 2008 monthly. And, um, Okay, we were excited to see it. This is not a super exciting movie, but uh, we watch it uh, many times. So I will show you two minutes of it. You don't have to. It was nice that we had this data. The, the, the higher uh, seasons uh, months will be in red. And um, as you go along, you will see here the bigger line of 98 coming pretty soon. Uh, so anyhow, we watched this a long, a long time, nothing too exciting. But what, what was interesting to us in, that, um, in, 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 this, uh, in looking at the data was the suggestion that the core of the city was where a lot of the action and the response to El Nino was occurring and the higher cases were occurring. So uh, that was a hypothesis just looking from the data. Uh, an unfortunate side of having this kind of data is that the reports become very stochastic. So you also have many periods in the white, uh, which means we have no report. We have ex apparent extinctions of the disease at that time. So you have to deal with that, and it's harder to, to do this with a mechanistic uh, model. So we basically, without going into details, we decided to do something much more simple. We said, well, we can make this uh, very phenomenological model where we have no cholera, low cholera, high cholera. And then we just have transitions between these states, so probabilities of making it from, if you were a TANA in, in a particular state, can you transition to a higher level, a lower level, etc. And this kind of model uh, help us to ask the question, is this part of the city in orange really distinct from the blue one? And the way we consider that is we make the probabilities a function of those groups. We can also say, well, uh, does the, the, 
do the probabilities depend on the El Nino? Do they depend on the state of the neighbors? We can ask these questions. The details do not matter. What was really interesting was that this effect of spatial heterogeneity was completely dominant. It was the strongest effect. You couldn't do anything with this model if you didn't recognize that the core of the city was different. And then there was this interesting interaction between the El Nino and flooding and the spatial heterogeneity, meaning that if you were in the center of the city, the effect of El Nino was different. So was the effect of flooding. And then we had this lag effect of 9 to 11 months, which essentially means that this model could be used for prediction, even if it wasn't very mechanistic and, and doesn't work very much for explanation. You can ask what is so different in the center of the city. This is speculation because here I can just show you a few maps, not some detailed analysis, but uh, many factors fall in this, uh, in this picture. In the left, you have the, the density, the very high density of the older districts. Here you have, uh, perhaps contrary to what you expect, these are the households that depend on tap water from the city in the, in the center, which is an interesting in all these diarrheal diseases and also in vector transmitted diseases, if you depend on tap water but there is uncertainty on the delivery, you may store water in ways that are bad for transmission. And this was a, a, an indicator of very poor housing. So anyhow, at least this, this matched that picture. Just very quickly, if we hadn't start, started by looking at that, at that movie, but we had started with the structure of the city, features of the city, uh, and not just the, the, the sort of transmission dynamics, we would have seen that the center of the city was completely different. Here you can see this is produced from, by a, a DCT master student from the Lausanne uh, uh, the Institute of Technology in Lausanne, which took the remote sensing, uh, the remote sensing of the city and basically classified into truly urban, more rural, yellow and, and water, areas that were, where water was very dominant. And you would say the core of the population, of course, a truly urban diagram, is in the core where we see this very high density. And you see some of the intermediate locations, which on finer analysis are also intermediate in terms of cholera. But for us, this was nice because we said, if we want to have more mechanistic modes of transmission and uh, that describe epidemiology, then of the periphery, it is very negligible for this response to ENSO. And this is, uh, just going quickly, the kinds of analysis, you can do even more, of course we are not very much in this area, we come from the temporal side, there are people in this room that work with very detailed spatial analysis, but this was again taking some measures of, of greenness, of classifying the, the distribution of the population, basically downscaling the population distribution to very high much bigger flux going towards uh, the periphery in this movement uh, model, which may be wrong or right, but these days uh, we have independent data perhaps to look at these kinds of movement. So the point is that we basically got rid of the periphery to say now we can aggregate the, the city, the core of the city, and we went back to our very well-established, uh, old-fashioned, ecological model Of 
we can fit them to data, and that's what I showed you here with these predictions. So that's the, the exercise that led to this, and you know, whether it's useful or not, we can see, uh, which is an interesting point. Now, I want to, to go to this disease, because in the data set, we also have both of our we haven't looked at this very much, but if you are interested in the real that it is this virus who is responsible for most of the morbidity and the mortality of children. Cholera, of course, is a terrible, terrifying disease. But this rotavirus has many more cases. So we said, well, let's look at this data for the poor and very And what was interesting is that we saw something we had not seen before. There's no way to the poor, the very Green again, the number of cases is lower, but we also saw that the seasonality was completely different. And that to us was a surprise. So this is the seasonality. So these are the, the average cases in box box like So this is January going to December, and you see these two peaks per year, a more endemic pattern here. This pattern in the periphery is mostly a peak in January. And by the way, this pattern is what you see in the rural area of Madla, and this is the well-known seasonality of rotavirus in that part of Bangladesh. This end of contrast is in the literature, but for different latitudes, different geographical locations. This is within the city. And so we ask what, what is going on here. And if you notice, the post-monsoon or the monsoon peak is only present in the core. We can discuss whether this is an effect, an artifact of the reporting. And I, you know, that takes a long discussion. I will not bore you with that, but if you're interested, you can go ahead. Now, we can why we did the same thing. We can aggregate the point delivery, we can couple them, and then we just have a slightly more complex compartmental model because we follow the numbers of the maternal immunity. If this is, uh, you have it multiple times, you have to build immunity. So we have those that were the first infection, second infection, and we could look here acquiring more and more immunity. And we have this couple between the two parts of the city. Again, we can fit these two data. We had a transmission rate that was a function of flooding. We could test if that effect was important. Now, I, again, this, the details are not important. This is just to say that we can fit this model. The best model had the effect of climate. It had this distinction. Just to show that more or less the model captures the patterns, but this is the conclusions, and I think it's interesting. I say what? So you can pick this and estimate the force of infection. This is not the incident. This is what an individual susceptible would feel as the, the risk of the disease. Right? If you are in the core of the city, it's much higher. It also has two peaks per year. And interestingly, the second. Uh, Second peak is almost absent here, which is what you see in the data. But the effect here, this peak, can only be explained by the monsoon. So this has the seasonality of the monsoon. And interesting, the transmission rate has more interannual variation in the river, meaning that although the second peak is absent, when there was a bigger meaning of the periphery, it also showed this variation. So you see that the, the the periphery is behaving like these epidemic regions that are more susceptible to climate variability, while the center is more endemic and is really responding on a seasonal basis to the monsoon. And, and what is interesting to me is that you don't think of this disease as climate sensitive. We can speculate that it is the conditions of very high contact, very high density, vulnerability in the core of the city that creates this susceptibility to the monsoons and this more endemic condition in the center. So completely different conditions. Let me end with what we are trying to do here in India. So, yes, all, all our colleagues from this part of the, the country will be arriving late. So I can say what I want because whether it's right or wrong, uh, no one knows. But, but the, this is work by Mauricio, he's a graduate student at the University of Chicago. And here we have a city in this arid region, a uh, vector transmitted disease, uh, now a different vector than the one in the rural areas, and a vector that flies on storm water. So this is a truly urban vector does not exist in, for example, Africa or, or uh, Malaria, and that makes this 
So you can eliminate, try to eliminate malaria and succeed in the rural areas if you get a problem in the city that gets worse or that you cannot completely eliminate in terms of reservoir for this disease with all the problems of people storing water. So we wanted to look at the But what would it take to eliminate the problem? Or, or have it, the, this takes an enormous uh, surveillance, an enormous control effort. So can we uh, look at this problem? What I wanted to show, this is yet, this is yet at the level of wars. This is the wars of Amenaban. It's not a very fine scale, but it's the scale that we can go for the moment. And these are some of the, the one of the slides done. And these are patterns of risk, essentially taking the number of cases, normalized by the total cases of the other. And what you should see that is really apparent that the spatial pattern of risk for these diseases seems fairly stationary. If you are in a bad part of the city, it's going to be uh, that way uh, over time. Which is not necessarily the case, as we, perhaps we will see in, in, uh, in dengue or in other diseases. But then we can ask what, uh, what is responsible for these patterns. At a very simple level, if you cluster it into two regions, whether, is, uh, whether you look at uh, Vivax or falciparum malaria, it is also interesting that you find a similar pattern. And we can take, for these two regions, the a series of, uh, you don't have to read this table, it's essentially a series of socioeconomic indicators from the census, including simple exploratory analysis. You can also, and you don't have to look at all the details, but you can also take the model I showed you for cholera, which was this model of the different uh, channels, the different districts, and the probabilities, and say, well, what if we do something like this here, and we make it, uh, and we look at the effect of temperature, the relative humidity, because this was one of the variables that appeared comparing with the observation for one given uh, year. Now, another interesting pattern Well, 
very correlated to this land density. So again, there are these interesting interactions of time, uh, temporal effects of these climate variables with what do we do with this spatial heterogeneity. And I think, you know, I showed you some particular approaches, but I think we are not even scratching the surface of what could be done, of the spatial resolutions at which we perhaps should go when we downscale this kind of predictions for the health and uh, we know that in other diseases the patterns will be less stationary and looking forward to hear about dengue and so we have to consider these, these kinds of interactions and what kinds of approaches are better suited including uh, how this um, interacts with the intervention efforts and I know that the intervention efforts here at least in these cities which both in Surat, which is uh, actually where we are working also now, um, and where I have this picture to show that similarly the patterns of risk are stationary for both species, not shown here in this city. So if you live in a bad place, you are in a bad place, and it's interesting, you know, why? And so you can say that the control efforts, which have been operating for a long time, and fairly successful in this city, with incredible efforts, uh, are, are, are probably aware of some of these. They, they respond to, they, they spread as a function of risk, etc. In the, in the previous season. But are there aspects that uh, can be improved in terms of targeting intervention? If we, and not just targeting the intervention we do now, but what should we do if you are, whether you are designing cities, whether you are thinking of water supply, it doesn't need to be vector control. It could be other forms of intervention that could be more effective in other So I hope we have some discussion of, uh, of that. I'm going to end uh, here. Thank you for your attention. Uh, so let's go directly to the point. So we studied actually the geography of dinghy in Delhi um, using several data. The first one was surveillance data. This is a work I did actually for during my PhD, so in geography uh, in 2010, let's say. And the second set of data are data we collected on the field directly in collaboration with Pasteur Institutes and uh, National Institute of Malaria Research in Delhi. So I will go to the point. This, you can see actually this is a, uh, the data related to surveillance in Delhi. So uh, actually I mapped the cases during uh, three years, 2008, 2009, 2010. So as a geographer, I'm highly interested actually of the speciality of the disease, but at the very local level. Because we want to understand actually the, the relation between socio-economical factors and the incidence of the disease. And for that, my opinion as a geographer is to go at the root level. Uh, so sometimes it's complicated actually because we have a lack of data. You know, the study you show actually is very interesting because you have information about water access, etc., etc., from the census at the world level. When you want really to go at the ground level, you don't have any data. For example, we wanted in Delhi to go at the scale of a colony. You have more than 2,500 colonies in Delhi, while in 2001 you had only 180 wards. That means in some ward you had a mix between rich colony and poor colonies. But I will explain a bit more methodology after that. So the first important point we have in geography actually is to specialize the disease. So we map dinghy cases during three years. And then we realize a, a classical autocorrelation uh, studies. And this is a local autocorrelation to map the output of the disease. This is a kernel density map, which allow to see uh, the intensity of dinghy cases in the city. What is interesting, actually, you show us some aggregated data. Uh, here we have the aggregated data, so 1,200 cases per year in 2008 and 2009. You could think that the system is stable. 
you have relation with climate, of course, it was not too important monsoon, so the cases remain quite stable. But when we are mapping the geography of the disease, you can see that we have a highly different geography in 2008 and 2009. So um, let's say stability at the, at the global scale is hiding actually a more complex um, geography at the local scale. For example, in South Delhi, which gather all, let's say, important uh, rich colonies, uh, South Delhi was not infected in 2008, while in 2009, you can see the main hotspots are located in, the, in this area. 2010 actually is a bit particular uh, because we have a big epidemic in Delhi registered this year. And you can see actually a local spread, but at a much bigger distance. And this is due actually to the climate uh, factors because the monsoon was bigger. So from, from June it started, normally it's more about July, August sometimes. And it lasted more time, so it gave more opportunity for the disease to spread from the local foci to the neighborhood environment. Uh, okay, this is another way to say heat. You can see here, this is a mapping of all the dinghy uh, clusters, but spatio-temporal clusters. That means we link the cases in space, so it was more less than 100 cases, and in time. We connected cases only if they were distance uh, of 20 days. That means they can be next to each other, but not related, because uh, time is too, uh, too important between uh, the two cases. And you can see actually, when it's blue, that means the uh, cluster started early in the year. And when it's red, that means it started at the end of the year, at the last of the epidemic. And you can see that the bigger clusters are all the blue, are all in blue, actually. That means, you know, the earlier the clusters appear, the bigger will be the, the numbers of cases. Again, it is related to, uh, to uh, climate factors, because in Delhi, uh, winters are very uh, cold compared with South, South India, et cetera. And actually, sometimes it's zero degree during January. So that does not able in transmission during wet winters. And what will stop epidemics is most of the time the arrival of winter. So that means if we had increase of temperature in Delhi, those clusters will last longer and probably will contaminate more people as well in winter. The second step actually was then to uh, really understand the, uh, as I say, socioeconomical factors of risk. So this is a map of Delhi. We realize a grid, as you did actually, which is the best way to do it. And we integrated several information, not related to ward level, as I said, but related to property tax, which sound strange, but actually the property tax in Delhi is calculated not only about the incomes, but as well to the access to the city. Do you have a good access to infrastructure? The density of population, when one constructed the, the, your localities, it is an old one or, or not? Is it a slum or is it a well-developed area? So we created an index. Uh, this is, okay, uh, as we say in French, car voyage, in uh, grids, let's say grid of 250 meters per 250 meters, mapping, uh, let's say, socio-economical uh, environments. You can see in red, this is impoverished uh, area with high density of population. We integrated as well population in these studies. Uh, using remote sensing, and in blue, the high incomes area. Okay, and then I will go through, uh, through that. So actually what we could see uh, for the, uh, with the surveillance data is that we had not only a very d uh, important difference in the geography, but as well in the connection with the infrastructural uh, factors. That means, as I say, South Delhi was not infected in 2008, but it was in 2009. Actually, this is due to the invasion process. As I said, you know, uh, the more the clusters, uh, if the clusters appear at the beginning of the epidemic, you have important cases around. And actually, the geography will be defined by the invasion, the place of invasion of the virus. So it has more importance than the socio-economical factors in itself. But we decided then to uh, create a research uh, group with NIMR, and we went this time on field to collect data uh, using, using rapid diagnostic tests uh, related to IgG, IgM, and NS1. So we decided to sample 18 colonies uh, presenting different types of environment from impoverished high docency to high incomes areas. So we went in this, in this area, we tested people, uh, families, individual, and we as well collected data on the, um, uh, some index related to the IDS, IGT, house index, container index, Etc. And these are some of the results. The idea actually to go on field is to bypass the surveillance problem you can, you can have with this kind of, of data, but as well to collect the um, asymptomatic cases. As you know, Dinghi has 80% of asymptomatic cases, so the idea was not to collect all of these 
asymptomatic cases, because it was rapid diagnosis tests, but at least some of them. And this is, I'll jump directly to the results. So you can see here on left, actually, the relation between house index and um, uh, this is uh, house, in, house index and uh, yeah, the typology of colony. As we can think, obviously, the deprived of colony has higher index than the rich one. This is part of the ratio. This is during epidemic, July, November. This is during winter, epidemic, December, March, and until the June. And you can see that the deprived of high expense uh, higher odd ratio compared with the other type of, uh, of colony. So we could think actually the more larvae you have, the more mosquitoes you have, the more dinghy cases you have. But it's not true. You can see here, for example, percentage of container control positive, this is in gray, and the percentage of past antibodies in population, IgG. And you can see that, of course, I, uh, impoverished high density has a high mean of, uh, of uh, individual positive for IgG, but rich colony as well. Uh, which is surprising. Actually. Uh, this is, for example, another study. Fast, we could so, uh, see that 37% of population were IgG positive in Delhi, which is not much. Uh, I don't know what is the situation in South India, but I read that in China it's 90% of population presenting IgG. So it is a huge difference, in my opinion, related as well to uh, climate factors. So this information is very important for us. That means we cannot predict epidemic related to the past epidemic. But we cannot as well predict it related to the uh, status of colonies. This is due actually to the mobilities. You mentioned that a bit before. And in Delhi, it's actually uh, the fact. You can see that rich area are highly central area. That means lots of people will come and work in this, in this type of, uh, of colonies and will bring the virus with them, most of all when 80% of cases are symptomatic. Uh, this is as well the local one. You can see ecological level. This is an individual level. And so we collected information regarding uh, age, uh, where they're using repellents every day, what type of access water did they add, etc. like something like 15, 20 questions. And actually what come out of the, of the model is that using repellent was protective at the family level. And once again, water access was very important in, the, in these factors of uh, exposure individual. So we are talking now about the mobility. Actually, we want to approach mobilities in Delhi to really and to really prioritize the place where vector control will be done. I think it's quite an illusion to think that we can't control mosquitoes everywhere in a city of, uh, like Delhi, where you have more than 15 million inhabitants. So the idea is really to create a priority of an uh, area to be controlled. So we want to integrate in the next step uh, the individual uh, mobilities using several information. I will go back. So this is, of course, the, one of the methods we would like to develop is the cell phone use. Uh, this is, for example, to track mobilities every day and at several, oh, excuse me, little bit of music for you as well. So you can see here, actually, uh, how do I switch off the sound here? So this not uh, been done by us. This has been done by French researchers. They use, actually, uh, cell phone tracking in all France. And you can see, it's very interesting actually to track these mobilities, which are always, always difficult to track. You can see this is a normal day actually here. Oh, you can see here, you Tuesday. Oh, how do I stop that? Okay, I will go back. Okay, this is a weekday. So the darker it is, that means the more population you have. This is a Wednesday. Everyone is at work. You can actually detect all the urban, important urban area in France. This is Paris. This is Lyon. This is Marseille, etc., etc. So people are working. You can see that very well using this. And this is what happened actually Friday. Same people starting to leave and look at the Saturday. What happened? People are going in the countryside. That means for us, we can track this mobility. You can see here Paris is empty compared during the weekday, and you can see all the surrounding areas of where people are going. And you can track that all years wise. This is actually as well during holidays here. You can as well see that during yeah, summer holidays. You can see all the people going on the coast of France. So actually we could do that in Delhi. The idea is uh, of, we, we could use that as well in India, but at the, at the local scale, which is not really being done, trying to okay, observe which are the local, the central space in Delhi, and trying to connect that uh, with the ph phylogeography of the virus. This is the another step, actually. We would like to sequence the virus, as it has been done uh, in Rio, if I can 
go back to the presentation it would be good okay as you know I'm geographer so you know this better than me actually in Rio they could actually the sequence of virus and they could detect the central uh, centrality of the dispersion. For example, you can see that all the individuals being infected here had the common strain than people being infected in the central area of the, of the city. So that tells us, okay, people, the problem in GIS is that you always locate individuals being affected at the at their residence, where they live. But you don't understand where is the place of uh, contamination. With that, you can understand, okay, these people are in connection. Probably the place of infection is here. But this is highly costly, uh, so that means we cannot do that in a routine way. So the idea is really to do that on a year, on a two, or one or two years, to use as well a uh, cell phone and to calibrate the model between the two. Does the virus follow the population uh, movements? If yes, okay, we can say so this is true for one, year, one two years. Use this name for we can as well locate better the, the, the area where mosquito control will be done. Okay. But next step is to do to really understand what to do in this area. It's easy to say we want to control mosquitoes, but then what to do? And this is the, my colleague part, I guess. <laughs> we want to do is do some experimental mosquito control or environmental hygiene. So we actually implement an intervention based on hypothesis on spatial temporal patterns, and then see what happens. <laughs> I think that's the, the easiest way to put it. So the idea, I mean, we're, we're working on this, obviously, in Delhi, and we're probably in a bit in Thailand and Philippines. Uh, we want to identify hotspots um, of, of transmission, uh, infer routes of connectivity, and then obviously we want it to intervene in these, in these hotspots. But the situation has to be considered uh, locally because, as, we, as you've seen, Delhi, you have dengue transmission, which is highly seasonal, driven by the, the climate. Whereas in Thailand and Philippines, we have a climate which is suitable for dengue transmission all year round. So we're not going to do the same thing everywhere. So this is what Olivier found. We found um, from his spatial clustering. Now, between two years, it was remarkable. Um, from from the, the currents of 2010 dengue cases, so the first 100 cases identified through the surveillance system 210 occurred within 200 meters of a dengue cluster from the previous year. So we've had several months of no dengue cases happening, and yet suddenly it starts again, the season starts, and you have, what, 35% of those first 100 cases actually occurring within 200 meters of what we recognized from the previous year. Now this is kind of thinking, well, how on earth can this happen? Well, we do know that the virus can persist in mosquitoes, in the eggs, so that's, that's a possibility. Um, it may well be that it could persist in humans. Um, it's probably unlikely, but we do know that there's long-term uh, viral transmission of West Nile in, in animal models. We believe persistence in viruses happens. What does seem, it's possible that there is some kind of um, tropism for the kidney, and then the virus could come out again. And even though you'll have an immune response which actually kills the virus, it can transmit just before it gets done. So th this is a big hypothesis that we're not we're trying to address, but it's, we don't think it's. But the, the simpler one is simply that actually, when you actually look in the winter in, in Delhi, there are actually urban hotspots. It's actually pretty warm in some areas, even though the general temperature uh, it goes down to below 14 degrees, which is when the mosquitoes stop being active. Uh, we're now talking about urban heat islands. And so what they actually, I mean, all this graph shows is that we have on the right-hand side socioeconomic status. And what you have actually is this is, um, this is nighttime winter temperatures. And you can see in these highly populated and relatively poor areas, you can have up to, which actually even more, 10 degree centigrade difference in temperature in winter at night. And that's substantial. Um, you know, if we're talking a temperature which is fluctuating well, all we need to do for the mosquito is to get it above 14 degrees, and then we can have active transmission. It won't be very great, but it can actually persist. Um, so, and, and then what we did find is another survey um, carried out by the NMR with, um, with Olivier, looking at the house index, which is the number of positive, number of houses treated or found with positive um, mosquito larvae. You can actually see 
in the rich area, which is the dotted line here, you can see that it, in the winter it just disappears. You can't find a, a, a mosquito larvae anywhere. But actually what you can do is you can find in the low density poor areas, you find larvae there. Now, okay, it could have been there for quite a while, but they, you know, when, they're, when it gets too cold, they will eventually just die and decompose. This does suggest that there's active mosquito activity in wintertime in the poor areas, likely associated with urban heat islands. So, we don't know, um, and these are extremely heavy studies to do. So, what we thought we, we're trying to do now is we, we characterize the local dengue epidemiology the best we can, and then we're going to implement some kind of experimental mosquito control methods, and then we're just going to measure a reduction in dengue. So, you know, it's, we're, we're going to try and see. Um, so, Delhi strategy, well, there's two. We, 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 we benefit from the cold season, so we can map the dengue cases the previous year. We then say, well, we reckon with good probability that in these high dengue clusters, that's where dengue will start the next year, so that's where we should put our control effort, focused around even if it's just surveillance cases, which are not great, we just focus around these areas and then see if we can just reduce the beginning of dengue transmission season. And, and then, you know, our, our output, because we have to do this on a vast scale, so our output is not, we're not going to measure seroconversion. We're just going to, we're going to measure what's, what the service surveillance system, system uses, which is just number of cases in the hospital. What we're looking for is a massive effect. So we're going to treat areas and we're going to not treat areas which had clusters, and then we're going to see what happens uh, in the surveillance system with respect to that treatment. Now, uh, this, I mean, I'm going to put two mosquito insecticidal approaches we're using. You don't have to. We can do anything you like. Um, these are sort of rather trendy ones that were currently uh, operational, but you can do our environmental hygiene approaches. There's no need to splatter insecticide everywhere, but these are the two ones we're, we're actually currently doing. This is a very popular one at the moment. It's called auto-dissemination of uh, a juvenile growth hormone, which specifically targets dipterans, it's called pyroproxifen. It's completely non-toxic for mammals and, in fact, vertebrates. Um, only crabs have a bit of a trouble with it. Um, it's, it's been around for a long time, um, but it's used in agriculture more than, more than here. And it's simple, actually. It's a dust. So the female will come in looking to lay her eggs. She will pick up the insecticide dust, has no effect on her, but when she then goes away to lay her eggs in natural breeding sites, which we're unable to find, she will deposit um, this insecticide in the same place where she puts her eggs, and then the pyroproxfin will go and kill her eggs. So we're actually getting the female to disperse the insecticide, which will then kill her own offspring. And we reason, well, one, it's very powerful insecticide, and two, we reason that she can find the oviposition sites, that's the egg-laying sites, better than we can. And it's a lot of work. I mean, I don't know how many entomologists in this room, but it's just so heavy. I mean, I remember being an entomologist. <laughs> it's much nicer being an epidemiologist. You can just sort of hang out with a computer. Um, so we, we trialed this in Madeira because you might know that Europe had its first dengue epidemic for, gosh, a long time in, in Madeira um, a few years ago. And so they were desperate that we do something. So we trialed it, uh, a very simple pyroproxfin auto dissemination study. And what you can see um, actually in the top hand, we did a, we, it, it's the same site control before and, um, and, and, treatment, uh, and, uh, and treatment after. So above you can see this is, com this is relative. So green is the sort of standard number of mosquito um, adults and larvae we found. And then the impact of uh, a few weeks of pyroproxin dissemination in red showing the percentage mortality. Now, it's not perfect. Um, we do have issues of wind, <laughs> which seems to be causing some problems. In the right-hand side, you can see that it doesn't work that well, whereas we have a concentration on this side. But this was the first study, and we've repeated it uh, actually in Funchal, which is a more complex. This is um, Paul de Mer, so it's on the sea. Uh, Funchal also on the sea, but a much more complex area, and it seems to work pretty well as well. Um, sorry, this is just data from, from a colleague of mine, Greg Devine in Australia, showing actually, compared with the, the control, the efficacy in terms of mortality of this pyroproxifen at different mosquito densities. 
Um, and then we come back to basically our big argument is the current methods on the left-hand side, there's lots of sprays and fumigation and an index case gets, uh, gets identified and they p pour in and there's fumigation and they tip, actually this is from Thailand, uh, they tip pyroprox pyroproxfin in liquid form down the gutters and so the cost is huge and so what we're suggesting is using two alternatives one is the auto dissemination and which is a sort of rather passive you just let the mosquitoes do their thing and the second is using spatial insecticides which is the kind of thing you can buy in shops but we want to prove that it works so these are volatile pyrethroids like metaflutherin and transflutherin they seem to work pretty well you hang it up in your house and it's a sort of volatile repellent um, so the, the, the thing is, we're, the basic idea is that you know, we had a great success of eliminating Aegis aegypti from South America um, a long time ago, but you know, Sao Paulo uh, is not the same today as it was in the 1940s when we were successful, so we don't really have any reason to believe that the same technique should work today. So we have to modernize our techniques and we don't have the finances to do what we did in the 40s. Um, and so. Essentially, we're pushing and we're testing these, these trial compounds, which are actually, we can find them everywhere. You buy these things in shops, but obviously we want to make it a, a proof of principle and have a slightly better quality control of these available insecticides, which, um, which do work, and yet the public health systems probably pretty much all over the world don't actually use. So, I mean, this is just an idea of the kind of what we'd like to do in dengue or what, what we're currently doing in Thailand, it's a very simple approach. We're saying, okay, index case house in green, so someone pitches up to a, a hospital and they get ill. So what happens currently is you send out people to fog and spray insecticide around that house. We're saying, well, like, we can, you can do that. We know it doesn't work because actually what happens is it, the wind blows it all away. Um, and then so it works. It kills everything and then two days later the, 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 the mosquito numbers come back. So what we're suggesting is what we're trialing now is you have an index case. We know the mosquito doesn't fly that far. She tends to be fairly, you know, 50 meters, 100 meters, that's pretty much her limit depending on actually the urban structure and the number of roads and walls, etc. And so you, you just have this sort of radius effect. In the near radius you, you give them these hanging up emanators and, and then you put these auto dissemination sites out to have a barrier area. So the, the, the emanators that would be completely community controlled. So you basically have your, you know, your very local health worker who will have these to hand out to houses to put up. And they last for 21 days. And so by 21 days, it's, everything should be finished. So the idea is but the, it demands that we have to be reactive. But you know, within seven days is what we're running on from a hospital case, notification to central, notification to local, and handing out these sorts of very simple hang your own up emanator kind of devices. The pyroprox is a bit more complicated because you do have to have some experience. Um, I mean, it's not expensive. I mean, it's basically a bucket, um, and then the female with the water in and some hay, and the female comes to oviposit. The trouble is, People tend to steal buckets, so we're having to think about a novel way of doing this, but this is what we're facing. Um, so there are technical issues of the simplest kind, um, but we're kind of optimistic this is what we'd want to do. And then our readout here is we want to measure efficacy. So whether it's zero here, we can do zero conversion. This, this would be around about, about 180 people. And we can easily do zero conversion, proof of efficacy, we intervene, we do a, basically, it's, it's an experiment and see if it works. So that's kind of the plan. <coughs> and, and that's it. <laughs>